John, your fund has really outperformed peers uh, over the last decade, and I wanted to see if you could maybe distill that success down to one specific strategy or behavior that you guys do better than anyone else. I think what's really, really important is that we are long-term investors, so we are always looking out over the horizon you know, and making sure that we're not getting caught up with the short-term short -term noise, short-term emotions of the market, but to be able to say, hey, three to five years from now, what will these companies look like? So during that financial crisis, we were able to look out over the horizon, take a long-term perspective, and try not to let all the fear stymie us during that tough, tough time. So I wanted to see what your best call might be over the last 10 years. Is there any sector call or specific allocation that you made that you think really contributed to your success more than other things? There are a couple sectors that we worked on, but the one that really comes to mind is the real estate services companies. Uh, Jones, Lang, LaSalle, JLL, and C.B. Richard, uh, Richard Ellis, uh, CBRE. They are both real estate services companies known for leasing. Uh, they have uh, businesses that do the capital markets business. They have outsourcing real estate services. They really are a worldwide companies in terms of real estate servicing. And those stocks got crushed during the financial crisis. Um, you know, the uh, CBRE got under $5 a share. It got to be extraordinarily cheap. Everyone hated it and now it's up, bumping up toward $50 a share. So that was a sector that was really great for us. Another one was the leisure-oriented companies, uh, companies that, like Royal Caribbean, that do a, a wonderful job of creating cruises um, for American consumers primarily, but they're also global, they're all over the world. You know, that stock got under $10 and now is well over $100. People were very fearful during the crisis that people wouldn't cruise again. But in both cases, we looked out over that horizon and took that long-term perspective that we believe that real estate would be here forever and that people would love being able to get away on a cruise uh, down the road. Is there anything in particular that you, that you think you do differently that kind of sets you apart? I know that you're, you're traditional value investors, but I mean, the value is not done so well over the last decade, but you have. It, what wrinkle have you added to sort of the value investing playbook that's allowed you to continue to succeed where others have failed? I think on the one hand, the things that we do that have worked well for us is to follow Warren Buffett's playbook, where he always says, you know, you want to be greedy when others are fearful. And so during the financial crisis, when there was maximum pessimism, we were buying our favorite names. Same thing happened this last December. Stocks got crushed as we moved up toward Christmas. We were in there buying our favorite stocks, like Mattel and U.S. Silica, right before Christmas Day. And those stocks were up now over 50% just through this period, through the end of uh, February and early March. So being able to truly buy when there's that kind of fear in the marketplace is something that distinguishes us from our peers. And then finally, we worked hard to improve our debt analysis. We think often uh, value-oriented value firms, and we learned this during the financial crisis, we didn't spend enough time doing our own independent uh, work on making sure that our balance sheets were, balance sheets were exceedingly strong. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I think we've worked really hard on improving and it's helped our performance this last 10 years. So does that help you avoid these so-called value traps where a company's cheap just because it's not that great of a company and maybe it's saddled with debt? I mean, does that sort of allow you to avoid that minefield somewhat and, and pick the cream of the crop? Well, I think it helps us that if we make a mistake, if you, have not, if you don't have an over-levered balance sheet, you can live through mistakes mm -hmm. and you can build a business for the long run. If you don't have the right type of balance sheet, when things get tough, that business can go away. You can have a permanent loss of capital, which we're trying to really protect our customers from. Mm -hmm. And we think that uh, yeah. waiting to make sure we have these bulletproof balance sheets has helped to protect capital for us during the ups and downs that are inevitable in the market. And the volatility that's gotten greater, greater uh, than I've ever seen in my career. There's been so much volatility. You mentioned uh, the big up uptick in volatility in, in recent months. Is there anything uh, strategy-wise that you're doing to sort of take advantage of that or to avoid the, the downside of that? Well, we're trying to make sure that we try to make volatility our friend. And when we see stocks that are gapping down on maybe where there's no fundamental change in the long-term economic outlook of that business, well, that creates an opportunity. And I think that's an important thing. So volatility should be something that helps you. On the other hand, when stocks spike higher and maybe get overpriced, that can be an opportunity for us to trim, take some profits, and move into cheaper companies. So volatility doesn't scare us. And we think that in this environment where everyone's been uh, in this flight to safety, you know, more and more investment committees have gotten more and more conservative, so they're moving money to the safe parts of the marketplace. That means the stocks that are left out are, can be truly orphaned and be really cheap. So we're trying to find those cheap orphans in this type of environment. 
So you, you mentioned that you're looking more at company credit profiles. Is there anything else that you're doing uh, on a stock selection basis to sort of insulate yourself from the next downturn? Any other uh, types of strategies that you're using to protect yourself? Well, one of the things that uh, Charlie Bobrinsko, our, our head of our investment group, has helped us work to work on is that we are big believers in behavioral finance. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're in Chicago, and the University of Chicago is there. Uh, I'm actually vice chairman of the board. Uh, professor Dick Thaler just won the Nobel Prize in behavioral finance. They've had some other great behavioral finance professors there. So we've been trying to use that to help us. And one of the things that we think that helps uh, protect you against behavioral biases is to have a devil's advocate. Someone in your investment group who challenges uh, the perspectives and points of view of our various uh, reports that we put together on the companies and industries we follow. So I think the devil's advocate's been a big improvement. It's created better dialogue, better discussion for us to challenge each other in our weekly portfolio management meetings. And I know that you like to look way beyond the short term, so um, perhaps this is too nearsighted of a question, but I'm, but I'm going to ask it anyway. You know, what do you think the future holds for the bull market? How much longer can it go? Um, I mean, it sounds like the way your portfolio uh, is kind of built that you're insulated from any downturn, but it's still helpful to yeah. get an idea from experts like yourself how long we have to go in the current cycle. Well, as you know, you, you never know quite where we are in the cycle, and I always tell people we invest for this long run so that in case there is a downturn that inevitable, we know that downturn will end, and the mar stocks will march back up. Uh, we think that uh, if you get too caught up in the short-term emotions and try to predict the short term, it's really, really hard to do and often doesn't lead to good decision making. But overall, our perspective is right now, things are steady as she goes. Uh, market multiples are reasonable. The S&P, you know, 17 times next year's earnings is reasonable. If you look at uh, the kind of uh, interest rate environment we're in, we're historically low rates. So you put reasonable valuations with low rates, we think that means there's a lot of, uh, the stocks are not overpriced. I think that's really a big deal. Mm -hmm. Also, there's so much money in private equity, so much cash sloshing around out there. If stocks get beaten up and get cheap, private equity can come in and bid those companies up and take advantage of those opportunities. Right. So uh, we're still quite optimistic. As we talk to our management teams these days, people are telling us uh, cash flows are strong, the economy is reasonably strong, and it gives us confidence that things are going to chug along here and it's a good environment to invest in common stocks. And one last one, uh, a recession. People seem to be thinking that it's, there could be one coming by the end of this year, end of next year. The opinions really vary, but it's on the radar. What's your take on it? Yeah, no one knows when the next recession is going to come, you know, uh, and we just believe you just got to look out over the horizon. And Warren Buffett always talks about the fact that last century, the Dow started at around 66, ended at over 11,000. We had two world wars, we had a Great Depression, we had all kinds of challenges that faced our country. You know, our capitalist democracy is the best system ever invented. So if we do have a recession, which is inevitable, we'll recover from it and it'll bounce right back. And so I think investors shouldn't try to time the market and move in and out on the short-term basis. I don't think that's a successful formula. 